Section 4 of the History of the United States, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard. Part 2, Section 4. The American Revolution. Resistance and Retaliation. The Continental Congress. When the news of the intolerable acts reached America, everyone knew what strong medicine Parliament was prepared to administer to all those who resisted its authority. The cause of Massachusetts became the cause of all the colonies. Opposition to British policy, hitherto local and spasmodic, now took on a national character. To local committees and provincial conventions was added a Continental Congress, appropriately called by Massachusetts on June 17, 1774, at the instigation of Samuel Adams. The response to the summons was electric. By hurried and irregular methods, delegates were elected during the summer, and on September 5th, the Congress duly assembled in Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia. Many of the greatest men in America were there, George Washington and Patrick Henry from Virginia, and John and Samuel Adams from Massachusetts. Every shade of opinion was represented, some were impatient with mild devices. The majority favored moderation. The Congress drew up a declaration of American rights and stated in clear and dignified language the grievances of the colonists. It approved the resistance to British measures offered by Massachusetts and promised the united support of all sections. It prepared an address to King George and another to the people of England, disavowing the idea of independence but firmly attacking the policies pursued by the British government. The Non-Importation Agreement The Congress was not content, however, with professions of faith and with petitions. It took one revolutionary step. It agreed to stop the importation of British goods into America, and the enforcement of this agreement it placed in the hands of local Committees of Safety and Inspection, to be elected by the qualified voters. The significance of this action is obvious. Congress threw itself athwart British law. It made a rule to bind American citizens and to be carried into effect by American officers. It set up a state within the British state and laid down a test of allegiance to the new order. The colonists, who up to this moment had been wavering, had to choose one authority or the other. They were for the enforcement of the non-importation agreement or they were against it that either bought English goods, or they did not. In the spirit of the toast, may Britain be wise and America be free, the First Continental Congress adjourned in October, having appointed the 10th of May following for the meeting of a second Congress, should necessity require. Lord North's Olive Branch When the news of the action of the American Congress reached Britain, Pitt and Burke warmly urged a repeal of the obnoxious laws, but in vain. All they can wring from the Prime Minister, Lord North, was a set of conciliatory resolutions, proposing to relieve from taxation any colony that would assume its share of imperial defense and make provision for supporting the local officers of the crown. This olive branch was accompanied by a resolution assuring the king of support at all hazards in suppressing the rebellion, and by the restraining act of March 30, 1775, which in effect destroyed the commerce of New England. Bloodshed at Lexington and Concord, April 19, 1775. Meanwhile, the British authorities of Massachusetts relaxed none of their efforts in upholding British sovereignty. General Gage, hearing that military stores had been collected at Concord, dispatched a small force to seize them. By this act, he precipitated the conflict he had sought to avoid. At Lexington, on the road to Concord, occurred the little thing that produced the great event. An unexpected collision beyond the thought or purpose of any man had transferred the contest from the forum to the battlefield. The Second Continental Congress Though blood had been shed and war was actually at hand, the Second Continental Congress, which met at Philadelphia in May 1775, was not yet convinced that conciliation was beyond human power. 
it petitioned the king to interpose on behalf of the colonists, in order that the empire might avoid the calamities of civil war. On the last day of July, it made a temperate but firm answer to Lord North's offer of conciliation, stating that the proposal was unsatisfactory because it did not renounce the right to tax or repeal the offensive acts of Parliament. Force, the British Answer Just as the representatives of America were about to present the last petition of Congress to the King on August 23, 1775, George III issued a proclamation of rebellion. This announcement declared the colonists, misled by dangerous and ill-designing men, were in a state of insurrection. It called on the civil and military powers to bring the traitors to justice, and it threatened with condign punishment the authors, perpetrators, and abettors of such traitorous designs. It closed with the usual prayer, God save the king. Later in the year, Parliament passed a sweeping act destroying all trade and intercourse with America. Congress was silent at last. Force was also America's answer. American Independence Drifting into War Although the Congress had not given up all hope of reconciliation in the spring and summer of 1775, it had firmly resolved to defend American rights by arms if necessary. It transformed the militiamen who had assembled near Boston after the Battle of Lexington into a continental army, and selected Washington as commander-in-chief. It assumed the powers of a government and prepared to raise money, wage war, and carry on diplomatic relations with foreign countries. Events followed thick and fast. On June 17th, the American militia, by the stubborn defense of Bunker Hill, showed that it could make British regulars pay dearly for all they got. On July 3rd, Washington took command of the army at Cambridge. In January 1776, after bitter disappointments in drumming up recruits for its army in England, Scotland, and Ireland, the British government concluded a treaty with the Landgrave of Hesse Castle in Germany, contracting, at a handsome figure, for thousands of soldiers and many pieces of cannon. This was the crowning insult to America. Such was the view of all friends of the colonies on both sides of the water. Such was, long afterwards, the judgment of the conservative historian Lecky. The conduct of England in hiring German mercenaries to subdue the essentially English population beyond the Atlantic made reconciliation hopeless and independence inevitable. The news of this wretched transaction in German soldiers had hardly reached America before there ran all down the coast the thrilling story that Washington had taken Boston on March 17th, 1776, compelling Lord Howe to sail with his entire army for Halifax. The Growth of Public Sentiment in Favor of Independence Events were bearing the Americans away from their old position under the British Constitution toward a final separation. Slowly, and against their desires, prudent and honorable men, who cherished the ties that united them to the old order, and dreaded with genuine horror all thoughts of revolution, were drawn into the path that led to the great decision. In all parts of the country, and among all classes, the question of the hour was being debated. American independence, as the historian Bancroft says, was not an act of sudden passion, nor the work of one man or one assembly. It had been discussed in every part of the country, by farmers and merchants, by mechanics and planters, by the fishermen along the coast and the backwoodsmen of the west, in town meetings and from the pulpit, at social gatherings and around the campfires, in country conventions and conferences or committees, in colonial congresses and assemblies. Payne's Common Sense In the midst of this ferment of American opinion, a bold and eloquent pamphleteer broke in upon the hesitating public with a program for absolute independence without fears, and without apologies. In the early days of 1776, Thomas Paine issued the first of his famous tracts, Common Sense, a passionate attack upon the British monarchy and an equally passionate plea for American liberty. Casting aside the language of petition with which Americans had hitherto addressed George III, Paine went to the other extreme and assailed him with many a violent epithet. 
he condemned monarchy itself as a system which had laid the world in blood and ashes. Instead of praising the British Constitution, under which colonists had been claiming their rights, he brushed it aside as ridiculous, protesting that it was, owing to the constitution of the people, not to the constitution of the government, that the crown is not as oppressive in England as in Turkey. Having thus summarily swept aside the grounds of allegiance to the old order, Payne proceeded relentlessly to an argument for immediate separation from Great Britain. There was nothing in the sphere of practical interest, he insisted, which would bind the colonies to the mother country. Allegiance to her had been responsible for many wars in which they had been involved. Reasons of trade were not less weighty in behalf of independence. Our corn will fetch its price in any market in Europe, and our imported goods must be paid for by them where we will. As to matters of government, it is not in the power of Britain to do this continent justice. The business of it will soon be too weighty and intricate to be managed with any tolerable degree of convenience by a power so distant from us and so very ignorant of us. There is, accordingly, no alternative to independence for America. Everything that is right or natural pleads for separation. The blood of the slain, the weeping voice of nature, cries, "'Tis time to part. Arms, the last resort, must decide the contest." The appeal was the choice of the king, and the continent hath accepted the challenge. The sun never shone on a cause of greater worth. Tis not the affair of a city, a county, a province, or a kingdom, but of a continent. Tis not the concern of a day, a year, or an age. Posterity is involved in the contest, and will be more or less affected to the end of time by the proceedings now. Now is the sea time of continental union, faith, and honor. O oh, ye that love mankind, ye that dare oppose not only the tyranny, but the tyrant, stand forth. Let the names of Whig and Tory be extinct. Let none other be heard among us than those of a good citizen, an open and resolute friend, and a virtuous supporter of the rights of mankind and of the free and independent states of America. As more than 100,000 copies were scattered broadcast over the country, Patriots exclaimed with Washington, Sound doctrine and unanswerable reason. The drift of events towards independence. Official support for the idea of independence began to come from many quarters. On the 10th of February, 1776, Gasden, in the Provincial Convention of South Carolina, advocated a new constitution for the colony and absolute independence for all America. The convention balked at the latter, but went halfway by establishing a system of royal administration and establishing a complete plan of self-government. A month later, on April 12th, the neighboring state of North Carolina uttered the daring phrase from which others shrank. It empowered its representatives in the Congress to concur with the delegates of the other colonies in declaring independence. Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Virginia quickly responded to the challenge. The Convention of the Old Dominion on May 15th instructed its delegates at Philadelphia to propose the independence of the United Colonies and to give the assent of Virginia to the Act of Separation. When the resolution was carried, the British flag on the State House was lowered for all time. Meanwhile, the Continental Congress was alive to the course of events outside. The subject of independence was constantly being raised. Are we rebels? exclaimed Wyeth of Virginia during a debate in February? No, we must declare ourselves a free people. Others hesitated and spoke of waiting for the arrival of commissioners of conciliation. Is not America already independent? asked Sam Adams a few weeks later. Why not then declare it? Still, there was uncertainty, and delegates avoided the direct word. A few more weeks elapsed. At last, on May 10th, Congress declared that the authority of the British crown in America must be suppressed and advise the colonies to set up governments of their own. Independence declared. The way was fully prepared, therefore, when, on June 7th, the Virginia delegation of the Congress moved that these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states. 
A committee was immediately appointed to draft a formal document setting forth the reasons for the act, and on July 2nd, all the states save New York went on record in favor of severing their political connection with Great Britain. Two days later, July 4th, Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence, changed in some slight parameters, was adopted. The old bell in Independence Hall, as it is now known, rang out the glad tidings. Couriers swiftly carried the news to the uttermost hamlet and farm. A new nation announced its will to have a place among the powers of the world. To some documents is given immortality. The Declaration of Independence is one of them. American patriotism is forever associated with it. But patriotism alone does not make it immortal. Neither does the vigor of its language or the severity of its indictment give it a secure place in the records of time. The secret of its greatness lies in the simple fact that it is one of the memorable landmarks in the history of a political ideal, which for three centuries has been taking form and spreading throughout the earth, challenging kings and potentates, shaking down thrones and aristocracies, breaking the armies of, of irresponsible power on battlefields as far apart as Marston Moor and Chateau Thierry. That ideal, now so familiar, then so novel, is summed up in the simple sentence, Governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. Written in a decent respect for the opinions of mankind, to set forth the causes which impelled the American colonists to separate from Britain, the Declaration contained a long list of abuses and usurpations, which have induced them to throw off the government of King George. That section of the Declaration has passed into ancient history, and is seldom read. It is the part laying down a new basis for government, and giving a new dignity to the common man that has become a household phrase in the old world as well as in the new. In the more enduring passages there are four fundamental ideas, which, from the standpoint of the old system of government, were the essence of revolution. 1. All men are created equal, and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 2. The purpose of government is to secure these rights. 3. Governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. 4. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it, and institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles, and organizing its powers in such form, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Here was the prelude to the historic drama of democracy, a challenge to every form of government, and every privilege not founded on popular assent. End of section 4